viewing Lorraine Holmes on May 10th, 1988. Mrs. Holmes, could you tell us where you were born? I was born in Wisconsin. What he had heard about the Midwest was that it was a great place to go. So he packed up and went to Wisconsin, bought a tract of land up there, which he divided up into farms later, and they started a small town expecting a railroad would come up through there sometime. It didn't, but, he's, but he, <laughs> he developed a town anyway. Now, what did the name of the town end up being? He had it named and registered as Auroraville, and that, and that is where I was born. My father was a, was a medical student, Rush Medical School in Chicago, and my mother had been living there with him, and when my birth was imminent, he sent uh, my mother back home to have the baby. So I was born in this big old house which my grandfather had had, had copied. He had lived in Connecticut and lived in a sea captain's type house and he did not like the architecture <laughs> around him up there in Auroraville. So he sent back home for Master Carpenter and told him come out and bring his wife and stay as long as he needed to to build a house just like the one he had in Connecticut. So this house was called the Manor House and as the little town developed it was the big house and he was he was very happy there. But he had been a shoe manufacturer and he had brought his last makers out to um, start a factory on Lake Michigan and, but again, it was a call of the green fields farther west, and he decided to go buy this land, which he did. Mm -hmm. And what he did there was not to farm, because he didn't have that background, but he got good tenants, good people to work, and he began raising apples, and he liked to uh, uh, develop new species of apples. And actually, won the Northwestern Greening, which is very similar to the Granny Apple you see now, was developed by him, and he, he is listed as the one who had, had developed this particular apple in the textbooks that they use in the Aggie schools. My goodness, it's just like that grand tradition of developing the new pears in Roxbury by the Puritans in the you know, seven, mm -hmm. uh, 17th century when they first got here. And he did it all over again in Wisconsin. Oh, yes. Yes, and he carried his pockets are always full of apples, and whenever he stopped to talk to anyone, he'd be rubbing and polishing the apple and always handed them an apple before they left. And that's where he spent the rest of his life, was there. Now, about, about your upbringing and your young girlhood was spent me. Well, I was brought up in Ripon, R-I-P-O-N. You see it now often as the, as the birthplace of the Republican Party, and they have the little schoolhouse in this town. It was a town of about 4,000 people, and it was where there was a very fine college located, Ripon College, and three generations of our family have all gone. My my grandfather, not the not the the one I had been talking about, would have been my great grandfather. But my grandfather, who then took over the big farm, uh, he took classes at Ripon College, and my grandmother went there to school. And then my parents went there to school. Both of them met there, and I went there to school. And I've tried very hard to get a couple of my grandchildren to go there, but they weren't offering the courses that they wanted uh, particularly, so they 
did not go there. Well, of course, if they're based in this area, one has such an, a wealth of choices. Traveling to the Middle West sometimes seems formidable. Maybe you can get them there for graduate school. Oh, they love to go there because we had a summer place on the lake, which is six miles away. And in the beginning, when they were small children, their vacations were spent in Wisconsin. Now, um, as you were growing up, you spent your college years in Ripon. When did you start traveling? I spent my college years in several places. When I graduated from high school, uh, my mother and I went out to New Mexico to join my father, who was a, a medical officer. This is in World War oh, One, And we lived on the desert there until he was sent overseas. And then my father said, why go back to Wisconsin in cold weather? Why don't you go out to California? And go to school to my dad's old college friend who was a president of Occidental College, which is just outside of, of um, Pasadena. Mm -hmm. So I had my first year of college out there, and I loved it. And if I had, had stayed on, I may never have come east. Uh, but I didn't, because when my father came back from the service, he said, I want my family together. And in those days, you didn't argue with your parents. They, they did a very nice job of planning for you, and Dad had always let me go and do the things I wanted to do, but I had never been out of the state of Wisconsin until I graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. I'd done a lot of traveling within the state, and we were... I guess the second family to have a car, and that was because my dad was a doctor. And I learned to drive when I was 11 years of age. And we traveled all over Wisconsin to see interesting places. My other grandparents on my father's side uh, had come out there by a little different route. The family had been in, in um, Normandy then they fled to England and uh, lived in Kent County. Then they came across to Canada, and my grandfather was born in Canada. Grandfather Fote, the name in itself is, is different, F-O-A-T. There were two brothers that came down from Canada into New York State. One brother dropped the E. My, mm -hmm. my grandfather did not. And um, so oh, they I, ended up in Wisconsin. They basically. ended up in Wisconsin. And that is where the two families were. My father and mother met in college. That's how they got together. Oh, in Ripon. Um, now, after you went to school in Occidental, where did you go? I came home then to the hometown college, Ripon College. And that. I enjoyed it. It was we were only a couple blocks off the campus, but I think it's more fun to go to school away from home. Ah uh, yes. Because Dad had always been kind of prominent in various things in the community, and I was always known as Doc's girl. And I thought if I could ever get away and be be have my own name and not be Doc's girl. Well, I had a letter just a little while ago from someone I hadn't seen from college days, and he referred to me as Doc's girl, too, <laughs> so I didn't really get away from it, which isn't too bad. I really had, should be very proud of him, and I was. So, when, when did you meet your husband? Was that in the, the early Oh, well, then the second, the second year at Ripon College, this would be my third year of school, um, I was going to go to Ripon and then my father got very cross because they hired somebody at the college that he thought had been a slacker. He had not gone into the service and my father was an ultra patriotic person who felt that he had 
owed all of the privileges he had had, schooling and help and all, to uh, living here, mm -hmm. owed it to mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, you don't have to go to Ripon this year because as long as they've hired this man. He really was cross about it, mm -hmm. very. And I had a friend who had been been east and had been had gone to um, the Curry School of Speech. Well, from the time Is that I Curry College in Milton? Curry and College, no, but I think it was just a school. It was not a college at that mm -hmm. time. But she came back and she said, "Oh, there are marvelous opportunities in the east." But she said, "If I had a choice." I would go to Emerson College because it is the largest speech school and the most prominent one in, mm -hmm. in the country. And I talked to Dad about it. I did think about going to Northwestern because they had a good speech program mm -hmm. there too. But finally, I went to Emerson. And so my third year was spent there. I'd been Occidental, Ripon, Emerson. Then when I came home in the summertime, the dean of Ripon College called me in and wanted to know why I had gone out there. He said, I think you are the third generation, you should go to Ripon College. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, my credits are scattered all around, and my great interest was drama and speech. And so he, he finally persuaded me that they could work out a course for me. I was going to be short one year of language. Mm -hmm. And so I took first and second year of Spanish the same year. Yeah. And I yeah, got be done. <laughs> yes, well I did it. I the second year. I took the first year with the class and then I had private help mm -hmm. with the professor. Mm -hmm. And we got a Spanish newspaper and we talked Spanish and read the news off from Spain <laughs> and from the south, wherever we could get the newspapers, and that's the way I got through. Right. Well, by that time, I had four years of college spread around, and I wanted to go back and finish at Emerson. Yeah. And I had enough accumulated credits so that Emerson let me come back. And I did take in a full course there and was, was graduated that there. A, originally a building in It was originally Street. it was originally in Copley or close to Copley Square next to the old SS Pierce building across from the library. Oh that would make it Huntington Avenue. Huntington oh. Avenue mm -hmm. and we had our school was way up on top. Um, okay. Not on the level. A large the granite level. office building there. I think yes. Yeah. Well, that was attached to the SS Pierce. They was a, they were on the corner. Of course, the Copley Theater was right there. I don't think they were that close. Yeah. They were up yeah. farther. Upper. Okay. Up near the the. Um, well, I can't the stables, see stairs. The Stables Jazz Club <laughs> in my time. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. but there was a... I And I really had a very happy experience there. I was glad I went. And, of course, that's where I eventually went back and got my master's at, at, at Boston University. At no, I went back to Emerson and took courses in speech therapy because I was interested in that. Mm -hmm. But this time, well, of course, in before I got married, I had heard from the dean, and they said there was a school in California that had always had Emerson graduates, and they had to have an Emerson graduate to teach. It was in the San Francisco area. And he said that all, he had contacted people who had some experience in teaching, uh, around there, but he couldn't find anybody who would go way out to California. Well, of course, I didn't care where I went. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even find the, find the town on the map when I accepted the job, but the salaries were so much higher than they were here. 
and they would take me without experience as long as I had an Emerson degree. So I had a wonderful experience out there What's teaching that? Piedmont, and Piedmont that was is at Berkeley. Well, yes, yeah. right in that area. I lived in Berkeley, and Piedmont were, had no business at all. It mm -hmm. had a fire station and one church, three churches, three, the, the Jewish, the Catholic, and the uh, Protestant, all had a separate floor in this one building. It's Worked still, out happily well. I recall 20 years ago, was still virtually residential. Oh, there were no stores yeah. there. And the houses were on levels like this, and the higher the level, the more expensive the houses were. <laughs> but it was like, I've never been in a private school that was any more luxurious. Mm -hmm. We had oriental rugs, we had lovely, beautiful draperies, lots of Spanish carved Spanish furniture, and mm -hmm. lobbies, even had a fireplace fire going sometimes in the, as, in the entryway on a chill day. That was very good, and I would like to have stayed there, except I had um, gotten engaged along the way to a man that I had met when I was going to Emerson. Uh. And um, he kind of pursued the thing out to the Midwest, and eventually I said I would, but I wasn't sure I wanted to come back east to live. Was he, his family based here? Oh, there was an old family home old uh, family in this area, yes. Oh, okay. So he it would have been inevitable that you would have an eastern base if you... Oh, know. yes, yes. Yeah. Well, anyway, that gives you a pretty good idea of my life. <laughs> well, when you married and decided to come back here, mm -hmm. what was... I lived in Auburndale. What type of work was he engaged in? in he was a salesman, and he was with the Caicos Furriers for a while. Beautiful. Well, they still have beautiful yes, heads. Yes, very. They're nice. into their third or fourth generation of management, too. Mm -hmm. Well, eventually he he became a Parker Penn salesman and had the, the Northeast Territory. Now, as a, a young married couple coming to Auburndale, where did you live initially? Well, I lived, you mean yeah. a street uh, number? Yeah, anything? or a family house, rental? Oh, it was in, it was in a, um, a big old house that, and we occupied a couple of rooms on the third floor and a couple of rooms on the second floor, and the owner was related by marriage to my husband's family. And that's where we started. And we stayed there for a while, and this gets you. This is the pretty late twenties by now. Yes, when I was married in twenty-five, mm -hmm. and we were there at the time of the crash, the twenty-nine. And I know there have been a lot of changes in Auburndale. It was not very much built up at that time, and then. Well, they had a, they had very good churches and. Uh, I was a charter member of the Arbordale Club Players. We started it when I was there. The first year I was there, I immediately, wherever I go, I always get into, into dramatics. And when I lived down in New Mexico, uh, I was entertaining in all the wise. There were four of us, um, a pianist who was with the Philadelphia Symphony, Bravo. and with a and a um, woman who was a church soloist in Denver, and I was a third member, and I didn't have much back of me except having been in speech contests all the way through high school, and I played a ukulele, and I had voice singing lessons, so I used to sing, and I was young, and I had pretty clothes to wear, and I was chaperoned everywhere I went. My dad and mother went with Bravo. me. Bravo. Bravo. So it was second nature when you hit Auburndale and not much young person's theater activity. We well, to start something. 
Well, I, I did not start it, but I was part of the starting group. Uh, where did they have a base of operations? What auditorium did they use? Their oh, clubhouse. Clubhouse. This is actually an outgrowth of the clubhouse activities, and we had bowled there, we had become members, and we went to church there and met a large group of un, not, I was going to say unmarried, and they weren't unmarried, of married couples, some of them with babies, but we, I think, one time there were about 70 young people there, so we had, I had no trouble getting acquainted. I immediately, oh, I had, there was somebody there from Emerson, and she had told, passed the word along that an Emerson person had come in, and the church asked me to put on a program, which I did, and that's where I made my closest friends. Mm -hmm. People said, now we must see each other, we must do something together. Mm -hmm. So we wheeled our babies around. My daughter was born there. And, um, but it was interesting that my two closest friends were two Midwesterners from the Chicago area. And, they and had we met. all used to get together. And, and then we it spread a little bit. And we brought in some other people. And we had Bridge, Bridge Club up there. And we had, it was a very, Nice place to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've, I've, people we've interviewed from Auburndale have talked about that group. Mm -hmm. Now, how long did you live in Auburndale? Twelve years. Twelve years. And did you buy a house or in what? No, we rented. To, yeah, what caused you to change residence? Was it here in Newton that you moved to? Well, I moved. We moved first because we had friends. The Midwestern friend that that still is a close friend, um, there her husband was transferred back to Chicago. And we had, after we moved out of that place, which was too small for us, we lived on, we lived then in a two-family, and it was very close to the, um, where the old, where the old uh, railroad tracks ran through mm -hmm. in there. And there was a park across from our place. I liked it. We, it was a nice place to be. But with a child running around and up on the second floor, mm -hmm. no, we finally went into a larger place on Maple Street in Auburndale and lived very happily there with, with a family whose daughters, one daughter was just my, my daughter's age, and we are all still close friends. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. The girls just feel like sisters to each other, you know. Good arrangement. Now, that part of Auburndale on Maple Street, was that virtually the same now? Or? No, we backed into uh, LaSalle. The big old LaSalle oh, yeah. building was there, and our our house backed into the LaSalle golf course. That was, so we always skied on that slope. There's a, their big science building is there now. Oh, see that they has changed. Yeah. But the street, Maple Street, looks very much the same as it used to. We lived in a high ceiling Victorian house there, and that's still there. And then it developed they did put in some new, smaller places from there to Commonwealth Avenue, but it still, it still looks very much the way it is. Uh, you said you lived there on Maple Street for how long? Well, I included in the 12 years yeah. that was part of that yeah. time. And then we went to Newton Center with this Midwestern friend. We decided we'd like to live in the same house. so. We went over to Newton Center, got the owner of one apartment to move out to another place so that he could rent both apartments. Yes. To you. Yes. So we always had the upstairs one. My mother had come on. My marriage at that time was over. And, um, and mother came on, took care of my daughter, and, and 
that was another. We've always been fortunate in living with people where, where you just get to be like one family. Yes. And um, the same so exact thing happened to me. My really? Mother, my mother helped me raise my two mm -hmm. daughters. Well, I always, Carol's been a marvelous daughter, and but I give so much credit to my mother. Yes, exactly. And then we went back summers to Wisconsin. So Carol, she always told people she came from the Midwest. Bravo. <laughs> she's never said she's an Easterner. Well, I think she must think she is. Her children, she has four of them, of all born here in the East, and she married a, well, he was from New York stay, but she'd met him. She came and went to Middlebury College, and he was at Bowdoin, and they managed to make that long trip back and forth quite Bravo. frequently. Bravo. Now, had you uh, worked outside the home, or were you busy raising your daughter? Oh, I, I, I never have gotten away. I've never applied for a job, let me say that, never. I was was a home person, I thought, but I always got into these activities. Mm -hmm. And my husband had a cousin who was the president of Salem Normal School, and he was very, he, he told Mr. Palmer, who was the principal of the Newton High School, that he had a young cousin who had moved in there, and it, I had a speech and teaching background, yeah. one year of teaching at Piedmont. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, um, Mr. Palmer called me up. He said, we're desperately in need of a substitute. Substitute, could you come? And I said, well, the only background I have is is in speech and drama, really. I had, well, he said, I need somebody right now. We've had, we've had, uh, in the trade school, we have a class of boys, and they have driven out two substitutes. Uh. And if you can come in, I said, and the, and the course was business law. I said, Mr. Palmer, I have never read any business law and never had a course. I am not really a teacher. He said, if you can keep that class from disturbing all the school all day long, he said, I don't care what you do with it. You don't have to teach them anything. Well, I had the one inspiration of my life. I decided to do it. I guess I've always liked yeah. a challenge. Yeah. And I went in there, and here are all these big boys, and um, and I s decided to be honest with them. I said, I don't know a thing about business law. You all know more than I do. But I've been sent in here to, because your teacher is ill or something has happened, and I said, I can't imagine trying to teach you something I don't know anything about. But you could teach me a lot because I know nothing about it. So we decided to split up the class and each year, each time I went in, there was to be another person as teacher. Mm -hmm. And we had a marvelous time. I was there for three weeks and everybody had a chance to play teacher. And I was the pupil, and I studied, I took the assignments, I raised my hand, I recited. So that's how I got started, and I substituted for 10 years. And I was always a general substitute, and I went anywhere. Within the Newton school system? Oh yes, yeah. within the Newton school and system. And so that was from kindergarten to eighth grade, well, from I, nine to 12? I, I only did kindergarten mm -hmm. once. Mm -hmm. I was high school background. And in my teaching and drama, and this was a senior high class, so all of my substituting, I once in an elementary and said, I don't want to do this because I couldn't do all the things that I'd never gone to a kid in garden. I started, I think, in first grade somewhere, yep. and uh, I didn't, and that was so many years ago, I didn't know what they did. But Mr. Palmer wasn't interested 
so much and have any substitute anywhere else. So I did high school substitute for about 10 years with occasionally being sent into a junior high. And Day Junior High in Newtonville was the place that I just thought was heaven. The kids are wonderful yeah. there, and Mr. Pa Mr. Um, Burkhart, the principal, taught me more about being a teacher and a classroom person than any, any education courses I had taken along the way. And I, I loved it there. And I was, a, and they needed the librarian, had no library background, except having used one. And, but they also needed somebody to put on all the assemblies. Ah, ah. So that's how no, I was put they, there. Everybody had declamations back then, mm -hmm. didn't they? They mm -hmm. only had them at Latin school now, but back then, mm -hmm. everybody had them. Oh, you did a lot of memorizing. That was good. And uh, I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed putting on the assembly. Sometimes there were spelling bees. Sometimes we had speakers from outside. Sometimes, and then I also had the, the um, eighth and ninth grade drama classes. And, well, of course, <laughs> they hired me as the librarian. And I said, I don't know anything about this. And, and my principal said, all you have to do is just charge out books and take them back in. <laughs> well, the former librarian was just marvelous. She made a Bible for me on procedures. What? And I worked with her, and I, was, I had long-term assignments at Day Junior High School, teaching English or teaching anything that were there. But whenever I had a spare period, mm -hmm. I would go down into the library and work with this librarian. Mm -hmm. And so I I did did have it kind of the way was smoothed out for me and I had such marvelous backing from the principal. So I stayed there for thirty one years. But I decided that I needed to know a lot more than I did. So I began going back to summer school. And I started, well, I did do the speech therapy, but I also took some library courses. And finally, I, I got my major there in, uh, in library. In at, a, at what school? Boston University. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I'm not sure, I think that I graduated with my master's in 19... 53 or something like that, and I did all of my schooling, um, summer school, after school, evening classes, and I also was teaching public speaking two nights a week at the Newton High School. That was and adult education course. Adult right? education. I also was teaching diction at Academy Modern, so I worked downtown with the short lady. Mrs. Albert. Yes. Mildred. She's yes. still on television, you know. I know. I, well, she's always looked like a little pouter pigeon, but she, they were very good to me. I imagine you gave them some very needed skills, too. Well, that's, I worked with these, because they were not all the people going there, I'm heading towards towards uh, modeling. Right. That was one course, and the modeling teacher Finish. was Mrs. Hart, and she and her husband owned the Hart Modeling Agency, and I used to bring her home. She lived in West Newton. Newton. Yes, I guess it was West Newton. That, that's still a rather popular good school. Good well, you see, there. now they are trying to do more. Now, not only did I have this it was my classes were at seven thirty and ran for two hours at night. At night, yeah. And they fitted in with the two periods at night I had at the evening school in Newton. You were never home then. No, I carried a very heavy load for until Carol was. Um, well, I finally decided when I had to park in the alleyway behind the school and had to move rubbish cans and saw the rats scurrying around. It's almost boiling the street near Copley Square. 
It was on on the uh, yes, it was. It was farther north. It was nearer the gardens. Yeah. Okay. Up in that way. Yeah, in that block between. Uh, I was trying to Berkeley think. Berkeley and Clarendon, I think. Somewhere in there. Yeah. And it was not on. Let me see. That was. Yes, it was. Going in town was on the left hand yeah. side. Yeah. Well, I remember the 40s, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is where I was working. I said I'm not going to come into Boston anymore. I don't like that. So, so you tape it off <coughs> on night work, what, in the 50s? Well, the I 40s. only tapered off on one. No, on just the in town still had night I wouldn't. School. I just would not park in there. I just thought it was too dark, and then I had to walk out and come up the street and get in the front door. It was just no place. Now having, I would come home and grab something to eat and go off. Now mother was there to keep the home going. And I also had a young cousin who was going to school, living with us. And uh, College level? College level. He was at Northeastern until he went into the service. And that would be World War Two. Mm -hmm. And um, No, I don't know. Let me see. And I've lived in the Newtons, you see, many years. Okay, you were in Newton Center all this time. Or close no, to no, home. I had moved. When did you move from Newton Center? Well, I think it was about 1940. Right before the war. No, no I, I, my daughter says I get mixed up. They were going into the service. Okay, so that might have been They were beginning to draft, uh, draft people. Hello. Yeah. Is that? No, that's to disregard that. Else. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Well, I moved finally. This. Hello. I'd been in Newton Center, and this family that we enjoyed so much. After he was gone, had gone back to Chicago, we decided we could not stand that. So then we began looking around to buy a house. And uh, our mother had been selling property and she thought we should live in a house. She's not used to apartment. Mm -hmm. So we did. We, we looked for houses. We were looking in Newton Center because we'd made a church connection out there. But we didn't find just exactly what we wanted, and I'd sort of given up on looking for a while because we were comfortably situated. And uh, then my mother and his cousin took a drive one day, and they, oh, I had told them about a place, the prince, the man who was the head of the science department at the high school had an apartment for rent, and he built the house so that he could have his family down, his father and mother downstairs, and they lived upstairs on the second and third floor. And when he knew that, I guess he didn't know at that time, the real estate agent, who was sort of hunting for places, said she had this place up there, but she said, I don't think you'd like it, because she said it's, it still has some old-fashioned features about it. So that we thought we wanted a modern place. Mm -hmm. Well, Mother and Lyle went up and looked at it one day and came back, and they were so enthusiastic. They said it has three bedrooms, big rooms, twin beds in every room. Great. You want them, great big living room, fireplace, and there were some electric lights where you had to pull a string to turn mm -hmm. them on from the ceiling. It, uh, the bathroom, I didn't think was that old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it had everything you needed. <laughs> <laughs> and this man uh, had had this place built and supervised and had a lot of very nice features mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. And we went in there, and I guess around 1940, something like that. Anyway, I've been there ever since, and I've lived with four owners. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, it must have had features you enjoyed. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Well, that particular part of the 
Center. What street is it? Come Athelstein Road in Newton Center. We're, okay. we're the, in Newtonville on Oakwood Road. Oakwood Road. Now, has that changed much? From our street? Yeah. Our, yes. When we moved on to our hill, um, there were a lot of people up there. Actually, we're the only two families because it was built when it was the first house on the hill. The f oh, and was and it the only house on the hill when you arrived? No, no, by the time I had arrived, all these other houses had been built, but um, they were all single houses and zoned for single housing. And the only reason this place has stayed is because it was there first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was all woods around. I understand it was, mm -hmm. but not when we went there. But they're larger. Well, our, our house was a large house, but there were lots of teachers, some of them professors at uh, Wellesley College, some mm -hmm. uh, teaching in Boston, and the head of the of the. Um, Macmillan Company was our next door neighbor. The Flags, Mildred Flag was quite a well-known lecturer, the mother. And, um, well, there were a lot of very congenial people up there. And we got together at holiday times. We had open houses. And now the, there is only one person there that still, no, there are two people, only one that goes back as far as we go. And he has this past year moved over to be with his his daughter who mm -hmm. lives in Wellesley. Mm -hmm. And the house is going on the market. Mm -hmm. All of the rest of the houses are occupied by nice people. And we get acquainted. We have a neighbor <coughs> who put, has a big Christmas caroling party mm -hmm. every year. <laughs> and everybody comes regardless of their religious <laughs> faith. They all come and they all sing the Christmas carols and they, all of those who play instruments bring their instruments and it's <laughs> just a very nice thing. <laughs> and we say, how do you do to our neighbors? And we enjoy them and all that. But there's no time for anybody to see each other. Exactly. They're all busy, all working, all jobs. The mothers too. Oh yes, well now there, we have one, well, we've had three swimming pools put in, in our, our street. Mm -hmm. And um, people who just decide they'd rather stay home in the summer than get out in the traffic, and we'll, we'll have our good times here. But they are, there are three different churches represented up there, three different faiths, which doesn't make any difference when it comes to being good neighbors, but it does mean that on Sundays you all go off in different directions. Were the three churches established there in the 40s? In the Newtonville? Yeah. Newton, Newton had seven congregational churches, mm -hmm. and uh, I happened to go to the one there in, in um, Newtonville. Uh, yes, I would say there there has been um, there's one new church. It was a Protestant uh, Italian church that has built mm -hmm. over on the other side of the of the uh, tracks. Mm -hmm. Actually, that h highway going in there took a lot of houses. Which I was there. Oh, the um, the toll road, turnpike. Turnpike. No, when that occurred, the that sort of for that. split the two parts of the city. Our church is on the other side, the northern side. Now, you, as far as the crow flies or what, not right on top of that area. You're a bit away from it. But let's say in the oh, I'm 60s, a mile away. You know, but what type of impact did that There was a train. There was a train that went oh, yeah, through. Right and everybody could commute that way, and we mm -hmm. all traveled to Boston that way. 
But when the planning for that turnpike came through, how was it anticipated and from well, your particular area? Oh, because we It was were, anticipated that we would split the town. Yeah. You know, but the stores are on our side of the town. The school was on our side of the town. Mm -hmm. The library was on our side. And there there was the the Italian group was on the other side, yeah. Nonandum. And um, but Nonandum when I was at Day Junior High School, which was on the other side and still is, um, we had lots of Italian. And I I loved them. They were talented. We many of them were very musical and at, we had always had good teams and we had good good um, assemblies. We had one of my best friends was an Italian teacher who had gone to and on Fulbright. We had a marvelous group <laughs> of teachers there. <laughs> But that was they called us a country club sometimes because we we all enjoyed each other so much. Wonderful. But um, how often can you say that about the occupation? Uh, well, it has a lot to do with your administration. We had good administration. Well, that's, that's important. Uh, let me see what else. There's one thing I I could tell that that I was fortunate in being invited to join a literary club. Oh, yes. What of those? I went in in 1945. I was, Which one was it? There's only one literary the club. The literary club, okay. And was, wasn't that called the Every Saturday Club, and it was founded in 1870, and is the only, only um, literary club in New England, which has been continuously in existence from 1870 on. There have been other clubs, but this, it was the thing to belong to this club mm -hmm. back in the day, early days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they had long waiting lists of people. The governor and his wife were members, and uh, well, I could list Melville Dooley oh, yes. was one of the beginning. The creator of the Dewey system. Yes, and he tried to also start a um, changing the alphabet, <laughs> changing the, so that it was done phonetically. And he, he changed his name. He was D. Dewey. D-U-I, I think is the way he spelled his name for a while, and he was president of the group, and I have brought in all the, I'm, I'm the archivist for the group. I'm the oldest, the person who's act, still active, who's still in the club. Um, I'm not the oldest person by age. We have a, a couple more that are older. But I guess I'm the oldest one that's active, still right. doing a paper. Mm -hmm. And I gave my paper last Saturday night. The Elizabeth Barrett Browning yeah. that you were researching. That's the one we worked on. Oh, my. So that's the, that club is, we, we feel very special because we are, we're still willing to give up a Saturday night. It isn't every Saturday. Because it was in the beginning, because everybody lived in Newtonville and they walked to their various houses mm -hmm. for their meetings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it still convened in a private home? It still is, except for two people who are ministers or ex-ministers mm -hmm. who are members, and they didn't have room, and those people uh, use have use the church facilities. Mm -hmm. They pay a little bit for the for the um, use of the lights and the custodian and things like that. But we have done not for regular meetings but for our few social affairs that we have. But we do have an annual meeting coming up and then it will and then there's a picnic. 
and we go where most of our members don't live in Newton anymore. Oh, well. In the beginning, you couldn't get into the club unless you lived in Newtonville. Because, and I remember they had quite a discussion over, we had a young, young, over the line, one house into West Newton. And they wondered if we could break down the ironclad, mm -hmm. which is our, was worked on by Dewey, and set up as the model for us to follow. Mm -hmm. And now we do break it up once in a while because we think, after all, times are changing and some of our people come. We do have three members who come from the Cape when oh they can. Friend. Well, they were active members and, and you hate to miss, it, it became the nucleus of, there's my school friend group. Mm -hmm. And then this really was the social group mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that I enjoyed the most. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They were it came from different churches. They came from different areas. We have people who come, come in from Natick. We have a family that comes in from La Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Most of our people now are outside. <laughs> but had some roots in Newton originally. Oh yes, yeah, some roots, and although we, we will elect anyone now that seems to fit the bill, mm -hmm. and that not that we're special people, except that we are willing to work for two months to get a paper ready. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be a prepared paper. Ours we did a little differently because the person I was working with is almost blind and almost totally deaf mm -hmm. and she has been feeling so badly not to take an active part that I suggested that that I would work with her. Mm -hmm. I would read the play to her mm -hmm. and then we'd see how we could break it down for her. Mm -hmm. And what we did, we I found a lot of very good material mm -hmm. here. And we and Barbara ran it off for us and gave that to her. Then she took it home and she has a magnifying glass with a light. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she copied all this material mm -hmm. in large print like mm -hmm. this. She had seven uh, sheets of that mm -hmm. large print and she read it. Bravo. Using, and she was very happy over that. And then I picked up the play itself and broke it up into sections. Mm -hmm. And I would read a section and then I would assign, I took my daughter and son-in-law along with me because they were the only ones that I could easily get to. Great. And uh, gave them two principal parts. They're not members, they've been invited to join. We have other Wellesley people, but um, they have too much going for them to do it. And it's hard to find uh, people with children, young children, who can join because that means hiring a babysitter and our dues are only a dollar a year mm -hmm. and we don't we try to keep it just what it is a chance to hear papers and discuss them afterwards yep. Yep. and I think the first year after they organized um, they studied the Bible as literature oh wonderful and we've had... That's we had eight, back in the 1870s. Oh, yes, before my time. When I came in, my first paper was uh, on education. And it was just when they were beginning to, to have free the, the um, elementary schools, particularly is where we were starting a very liberal movement for a while, which was was thrown out after a while. It got to be a little too liberal. Mm -hmm. The children occupied the floor and, <laughs> and instead of sitting in seats <laughs> and were having a little difficulty in doing what they needed to have done. Basics. Although I think that, yes, yeah. I, and I think they're going back even more now to the yeah. basics. Yeah. And I'm glad to see it because it's pretty pitiful when kids can leave high school and can't read. Uh, what is the sample number of topics, let's say, over the last year or so, given at the Literary Club? What mm -hmm. you did, Elizabeth Barrett Brown, and you and your friend did. 
Well, we chose yeah. our own plays. The subject was historical drama. And, and that's going to be for the year? The historical dramas for the year. And yeah. each person who does a paper um, has a right to choose any play they want. Mm -hmm. Now, we've had two Shakespeare papers on Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. We've had another one on, on um, had Agnam 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 Agamemnon. Agamemnon. Uh, we had another one. Uh, we had another Greek one. I'm trying to think. That was. Uh, so there's been a great variety in the plays that have been chosen. And I, at first we were going to do The Ladies Not for Burning. And we'd had two very heavy ones before that. Mm -hmm. And full of blood and the, the fall of Rome and things like that, that we decided we'd do something. Now this play is called a comedy. It does have uh, scenes in it that mm -hmm. are funny. Mm -hmm. Christopher Fry. Yeah. yeah. But it is, it is billed as a comedy and as a romance. Mm -hmm. And there are two romances in it, two, yes, a secondary one as well as Browning. It yeah. was interesting because there were real characters in mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. and they had followed pretty well what they knew about Browning, for instance. Mm -hmm. So she, she gave quite a bit on Browning's background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, but the programs over the year, one year we did historic homes and their families. And I went to Tennessee because I... Oh, had, not necessarily Massachusetts. Oh, no, no, it's never. Oh, oh. And one year we studied rivers. And uh, that year you could do anything you wanted. The people that lived on the river, the people who lived beside the river, um, the, um, well, the kinds of people that have settled there, the mm -hmm. kinds of things that grow, and we would have the music and the um, art. Mm -hmm. Now one year we we did the cultural contributions of minority groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've had thinkers. We studied philosophers one year. On Shoulders of Giants was another. And I did um, King at that time. And that was interesting. Well, we did mountains. We did humor one year and do anything you want to. I think we decided, because so many of the dramas we have done this year have been tragic or heavy, that we would move perhaps towards something that will be lighter, yeah. just yeah. to vary it. But I think you could give the same subject to every person, mm -hmm. and every person, uh, every paper would be different. Of course, of course. Because you bring in your experiences, oftentimes when they decide to do these things, people will go, as I did the year that I chose Plant Dreaming Deep as the book that had influenced me most that year, May Sartens. May Sartens. And I was just I had just bought the place up in New Hampshire, a summer place, and didn't know people around there. And she had just bought the place in Nelson. So I went up there, and I took pictures of all the places mm -hmm. she mentioned mm -hmm. and did have a chance to go through the house with her. Oh, oh wonderful. And I had a letter from her. So when I had my paper, I not only had my pictures and my own paper in the background, but I also and told about the book. But I also uh, was able to bring in this letter that she had written. Oh, and good. one year we did. Um, I I chose. Um, I guess it was conservation. And. Whenever I could know anybody who's connected with any of these places, yeah. I write to them. Exactly. And I've had a lot of material that's been good. Now, 
one year we studied the published poets who have been members of Saturday Club. And who I did been? I did Louise Dyer Harris, who wrote with her son, who was the head with Washburn, the head of the science. Museum of Science. Yeah. You know, and they collaborated on books. And then she used to do funny little um, stories and poems and things and that went into a yearly calendar that the Phillips Company sold. Oh. And um, and Mrs. Goodhue did the illustrations, and she has been honored by the Penn Women's Association. <coughs> she has won national prizes for her paintings. She was at Rockport in the summer times, and. Then we've done poetry. We, I, I don't know what we'll choose for this year, except that we say we're going to think in terms. There's always a committee. A committee. A committee that's been appointed, but then everybody is supposed to think, bring in ideas, and we don't always take the committee recommendations. That, that's just something up your sleeve. Yep. That if nobody has any idea, then the committee is responsible for a thing. Well, you as an archivist, mm -hmm. uh, is there a uh, documentation kept of every meeting? We have secretary's report, and very often the sec secretary's report is uh, fairly long, so that if you miss a meeting and you hear the secretary's report the next time, you get a very good idea mm -hmm. of the content, mm -hmm. general content of the paper. Mm -hmm. Uh, then we also have a scrapbook, and I've been in charge of the scrapbooks. And when we have our parties, we do, people make place cards, and they have favors, they have all sorts of things. And any clippings about any of our people who, who do things, many of them are prominent in some way or another. and. Uh, you cut out the clippings and put them in the book. Mm -hmm. And I think, I can't remember whether it's ten volumes that I have turned over here. I, think, yeah. I have been keeping them in my house and was worried all the time yeah, that we'd have a fire, something yeah. would yeah. happen. And this can never be replaced. Of course not. And, uh, and it's such a chunk of human history. Yes, it is. There's, there's one... I go back sometimes and give papers to bring the newer people up to date on the history. We one time I did a paper on um, on the customs or traditions to see when they started and <laughs> what, and I finally found out one of them this year because I did a paper on the um, bathtub gin. <gasps> <laughs> well, yep. it was the beginning of the of the uh, temperance movement. Yes. What we were studying were the amendments. Yeah. And each one had an amendment, and I chose this yep. amendment. The committee gave it that title, something in bathtub gin. gin. Anyway, I discovered, and I had never been able to find in any of the books that I have read the scrapbooks that I worked on, just exactly where our custom of refreshments was an apple and water. But that's where it started. And we found a place, but they never did say why they chose, ex except it was sort of implied it was it made it easy for the hostess. Mm -hmm. And at the, our annual meeting, at the end of the year, you always have a bowl of apples and a pitcher of water yeah. sitting on the table. You may get something else to eat, too, but we've always kept our, our refreshments simple. In the beginning, they had regular banquets, and there was a Roberts family that were very well-to-do, lived in the mansion, and almost all the secretary's reports would say we were entertained at the mansion and they used to send out engraved invitations for the meetings and they entertained in their 
home and he'd had the partitions taken out between the two big parlors mm -hmm. so that it was one big room for the meeting. Mm -hmm. And then she entertained, of course they had plenty of help, Mrs. Roberts entertained, but, and was always thanked at the end, but the invitations only went out in the name of the man. That was very interesting. Oh. And the, all of the offices were held by men oh. in the beginning. Up to when? Up to, oh, I have probably have it. Probably World War One, do you think? I think that the, when I came in, in 1945, I think at that time, I don't think we had any women presidents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But papers all along had been delivered by men and women. Yeah. And were discussed by men and women. Mm -hmm. And it was the women who got the refreshments ready, you know. But and well, they, got, they had the thing, a thank you from the president at the end mm -hmm. for the delicious refreshments. And one, one member, and this was way before my time, uh, he moved into Boston. And he did not feel that he, that he really could be active anymore because he was out of Newton. But what he did, he hired a private car mm -hmm. and invited us all to come in to his place in Boston. And that private train was hitched onto the back of the train, and we all rode in in this private car. Had the had the banquet, his home. Was it? Did you get, get off at Back Bay Station, someplace like that? I don't remember. Yeah. I wasn't here. Oh, oh but the see, this was the way back. To, yeah, yeah. And and then the train was there to pick you up yeah. and bring us back yeah. to Newtonville. That was the regular commute line that was always always. Yes, there. it was in it was the um, New York and Central. Yeah, it's the same line that we have now. Yeah. Well, anyway, that. Well, they did it in they style were, back they then. They did, and at that time, Governor Claflin, his wife, were members. There were a lot. Well, there's E. E. Whiting, who was a prominent columnist, was a member. I remember I. I did a paper that year. They must have been on early civilizations. I, well, no, I guess that year I did, I did I, not Mark Twain. We did the, I, Mark Twain when we were studying rivers. We took the, his Mississippi stories. Oh, yes. um, this other, well, I can't think of what it was. I should have. I wasn't quite sure what you were going to ask me. Originally, a group of separate little towns, quite separate, mm -hmm. with lines drawn like this. You knew people in the other sections, but somehow um, it was, you had your own family owned stores. Mm -hmm. That I missed. They had such good grocers, such good shoemen, and oh, yeah. everything. And you didn't have to go out of the... You went to Boston once in a while because that was exciting. You went to Boston to the theater. Um, but now, all of these places where you like CVS have gone in, the chains, and there... I'm trying to think. There are a couple of little family-owned places that are uh, in, in the fringes of the yep. town. There's one on Watertown Street, which is a great place. Lamont's, I think, and Auburndale's another, mm -hmm. where the Lincoln people come in there to get their meat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a little one across the way here, I think, too. Is that a place? Wherever the it Honeywell. Is. The Honeywell, yeah, I yeah, think. That's yeah. a, that people go there to get their meat, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. It has the, the uh, reputation mm -hmm. for quite a while. Yeah. But all, almost all the other places are chains by yeah. now. Yeah. and impersonal. So that's an aspect that you... And then, because we don't get together as often, we don't know each other as well, and people come and go, and um, you really don't... 
you don't have farewell parties for them or anything. There may be a few families that, that well, but when I entertain people in the neighborhood, we have, um, I, I'm lucky if I can get six or seven who are free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because of other we have families. one Jewish family uh, in our neighborhood, and they used to give an outdoor picnic every year, and that was nice. But then it got so when I was going to New Hampshire that I always missed the picnic, and I was sorry. One year I made a point of coming down to be here for it, and and I met people then. Well, I met parents of kids that I'd had. I'd recognize the names, mm -hmm. but. Aside from that, there were people probably I wouldn't see again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yet they were virtually neighborhood people, right? They were all neighborhood people, and you'd wave at each other. Yeah. Your garages might back up to each other, and um, and but we were we're kind of isolated because we were on one hill. West Newton Hill was across, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we did to have a lot of big old houses mm -hmm. up there. Mm -hmm. Some of those places they have had a lot of land. Now my daughter always went to the Everts to, and they had a very nice um, a tennis court over mm -hmm. there. And any of the children in the neighborhood, and there weren't many children, mm -hmm. uh, were welcome to come there and play as mm -hmm. long as they didn't abuse it in any way. Mm -hmm. And then there was somebody else who had a swimming pool, the hearts up there. And again, all your doors up there were open to you. When we first moved, one of the neighbors, they were in wool, in the wool business, uh, but in the church, immediately invited us to a lobster dinner somewhere. Bravo. And uh, the Eddies were there, and they were prominent theologians. Um, and have, we had a lot of wealth in the church at one time. Mm -hmm. Now it's different. Mm -hmm. We're getting some young I suppose the yuppie crowd coming in, mm -hmm. and I wonder where they get the money to pay now for the houses, the mm -hmm. prices on the market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Shocking. It's interesting. It's still a nice neighborhood, but it's okay. not as close as it once was. No. It's a friendly neighborhood.